Let's play pretend. You either pretend or I'm going to tell a story, which is pretend. So I'm making up the story right now. Wait a minute. Imagine. <coughs> You don't have to imagine hard because this has happened many times publicly that history is aware of and it's happened other times on a very small level. Sometimes it's referred to as religion, metaphysics, philosophy. Now, of course, the times you hadn't heard about, you hadn't heard about, and so it doesn't have to be called anything. But imagine, what if this thing was religion? I'll try that for a second if I don't like it to hell with it. If this was, if this was religion, then instead of me just referring to it as this thing in life, speaking and radio station WDNA, we'd be talking about the gods. All right, how about sometime, even right now, maybe, the gods talk to somebody. They talk to somebody in this time zone, this part of the, this body, this part of the planet. And the gods start telling this person stuff. I'm talking about real stuff. Not just low rent stuff, but real stuff. And the gods start telling this person specific information about the very things that have always been considered to be the pressing questions revealing to this person. I can't believe I said revealing. Telling that this person quite workable descriptions of how life is operating in a way that that person had not seen before. Explaining, not a way, but explaining all the so-called confrontational disputes about good and evil and blah, blah, blah. The very things that theoretically humanity wants to know, and the kinds of people listening to me and watching these tapes sometimes, the specific things that you always thought you wanted to know, that you thought this was about, specifically. If I didn't cover it, let's just plug in your own kinds of questions and interests that you had at one time. But imagine that the guides was telling this person the very things that you always wanted to know. Now what? Right, historically, there seem to always have been, if we're going to take the great examples, which you know as well as I do, the apparent great examples, these prophets and religious leaders, sons and daughters and nephews of the gods that show up periodically, apparently. There seems to be several courses, little dramas that play themselves out. There seems to be a slight turn taken if we're going to talk about one particular area on this planet. Some group of people, some community in the largest sense of the word, had been worshiping paper mache donkeys and brass monkeys, soupy sales, progenitors. And then apparently this person comes along and says, nay, nay. You've been wasting your time. There is a new God. There is a God that nobody knows about, and you have been ignoring him, as they used to call God, him. And I'm here to tell you some new information that's going to make a lot of sense. And if it doesn't make a lot of sense, at least it's going to scare you out of worshiping these gods and worship this God. But in this day and time, you would not be expecting I'm saying you, as the people who would normally properly be attracted to this, that you would not be normally expecting a grand flash revelation of some new religion, that all of you are expecting a more low-level, semi-personalized confrontation with a swami, a guru, some enlightened, awakened person who had been shaken into some superior state through, perhaps still a lesser known, but still through a sequential, horizontal line of teaching going back to some ancient hoary times when all of this 
was supposedly common knowledge before we fell into some disreputable state. <laughs> so what if this person was walking around and life told the person almost everything that they wanted to know, almost everything that you think you want to know? Right, this is the kind of story if you can hear me correctly, that all of the great religions were based on. Even the well-known and lesser-known swamis, gurus, prophets, etc. That in some way there was a message from higher forces, higher sources, to this person, and then they told other people. And other people, verily, verily, said, boy, are we glad to hear this, some group of people, that this is what we have been waiting for. And it would seem as though that the gods had some purpose in mind. In fact, these so-called gurus, prophets, etc., always said there was some purpose, that the gods gave me this message to show you the error of your ways, to show you that you've been worshiping false gods and you're wasting your time. You're just, you're diluting the kinds of energy that man should be using for higher purposes. Or it says, God sent me here to warn you that enough's enough. But what if I told you in this make-believe story that it was not quite that simple? And in fact, when it appears to be that simple, you're dealing with very low-rent information. You're dealing with information that many people can use. You're dealing with information sticking with the religious facade for a second, that seems to have a religious impact over a large area of this planet or over a community of such size that it has historical significance in the horizontal long run. But may I suggest to you the possibility that it is truly not that simple and that if we were living under the auspices of gods, then I would have to tell you this, that there is overlooked, there are overlooked aspects of the stories all the way from so-called Hinduism to Christianity about the anti-gods, or in some other parts of the world, aspects of there being multi-headed gods that have certain duties specified and split up amongst more than one god. I would have to suggest to you, going from, I'll say, Hinduism into the story of Christianity, or even the Old Testament, forget Christianity, the Old Testament story of God throwing out one of his drinking buddies who started getting too smart, or who started getting too arrogant, who did something, and he threw him out. And that was the beginning of good and evil, according to some stories. I would suggest to you that it is not quite that simple, that the gods would not be revealing, or a god would not be revealing some sort of information, period. If such a thing went on, it would be in more in this matter, that a god was revealing information, comma, while another god was revealing, vis-a-vis -vis this aforementioned information, revealing disinformation, different information, Conflicting information. I would also suggest to you another possibility verbally that if a god was revealing specific information of some kind, then there would be another god somewhere also revealing somewhere to man the message of don't listen to that other. Do not listen. Inasmuch as the time zones in this planet, if you can recall what I've tried to describe allegorically, which if you recall from last week, I tried to get some of you to consider the fact that there is no such thing as allegorical. It is all moving into this time zone. It is the ultimate homogenization still at work. 
but we are the cutting edge. This is where life is the most conscious as far as our humble little planet and humble little us. And life is no longer just a teenager. Life is becoming here fairly bourgeois. Life is trying to draw in many of its own extremes. And this is the kind of reality that I was suggesting to you that there would be a God handing out disinformation vis-a-vis -vis any God that could be handing out specific information to somebody somewhere. Let's carry the story a bit further. Still assume that there is somebody in this time and place, this little story I'm making up, that if we were under the prevailing influence of gods, or a god, and this god was telling this person all kinds of information. And it made perfect sense. Would we not expect that this person, even if we, for the moment, bypass the possibility the guide said, look, I'm telling you this for a reason. I want you to go and tell somebody else, or I want you to do something. What if the guides just told him that and didn't say anything else? Like you always wondered, or you're a nice guy, maybe no preface whatsoever. The guide just told him this, him or her. And that was the end of the message. Would you not still expect that the person would do something? If you had been looking for this kind of information, you would certainly hope that under these conditions that a person would do something. Now remember, I am describing, even though this is fiction, some of this is based upon fact. One of the facts inherent in my story is what I'm describing, that this fictional God told this fictional person the very specific answers and explanations to everything that you want to know, and all other, how about this? Intelligent, right-thinking, concerned, humane people, men and women of this planet. Accept that as an absolute fact. Now back to the fiction surrounding this fact. You would then expect that the person would do something. Write a book, give a lecture, say something about it. Would you not? I know I would. Taking into consideration continually the fact that I placed at the heart of this, would you not expect that this information would be welcome? that there would be not just groups of people who might be hearing me and who thought that their life had been specifically destined in some way to pursue this sort of unusual activity, but would you not think that large numbers of people, if not everybody, as soon as they heard about it, would say, verily, verily, splendid, beautiful, may I take notes? Would you record this? Would you write it down, just what you have said? so I could have it. This is the very things that I have thought about periodically and wondered about, and by God, you just answered it. Surely I don't know how to remind you people that we are really in the land of fiction now. <laughs> but verbally and sequentially, does it not make a lot of sense? But that's not the way it occurs. When it appears to occur that way, surprise again, I offer you two possibilities. When it seems to have occurred that way in history, possibility one, history is, as many people suspected, a bag full of garbage. 
I think's the accepted intellectual description of those who naysay history. The second possibility is this. That which seems to have had some historical validity was extremely low level. But if we take the historically accepted examples of all the world's major religions and all of these apparently great people of the Buddhas and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and so on, then apparently my second possibility offered you must be fatally flawed. How could that be low level when it, by all accounts, not simply from the adherence of the particular religions, but by general account, there has been almost indescribable impact made upon the history of man by Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity that you could say, at least in the Western world, that the church, the Catholic church, had a bigger impact on history, just for one example, than every king and prince that lived for 1,500 years. That all these men and reputed one or two women slipped in that dressed up with funny hats and shoes had more impact in the horizontal world than any king, than any combination of kings, or if you put together a combo of kings, a team of kings, And furthermore, you could say, look at the, if you're an ordinary person in my piece of fiction, you could say, look at the great cultural impact it's had. Look how much religion X has had upon our everyday thinking, our mores, our laws, etc. But I suggest to you most strongly in my piece of fiction, I don't know why I keep fictionalizing this part and say suggest since it's my piece of fiction. But I always like that since it upsets some people. <laughs> and the rest of you, it leaves the door open. I suggest to you that that's not far removed from an absolute fact. That is my two possibilities that one, you should just ignore history. It's just rude noises that DNA and life made from yesterday's meal. Or what seems to be of historical significance in this sort of area, in the so-called God areas, that that which is recognized and accepted as being of some historical validity and import is extremely low level. All right, so if the second does have some validity, then a reasonable question would be, if that's low level, where is the high level? And I tell you that the high level hardly exists. The high level would be hidden somewhere within the creases and the folds of the first scene of my continuing piece of fiction. That is, of a God, if we were under religious conditions, telling somebody everything that you wanted to know, everything that the person wanted to know, everything that humanity wants to know, at least in that part of the world, in that general time zone, and everything that you wanted to know. That's the high level. But you don't hear of that. Not only is all of this fiction, remember, but anything that is worth even talking about does not exist out there. I'm not talking about this fictitious person and religions and so-called shortwave prophets we're talking about something else. What if my fictional person to whom the God or gods had whispered in our day and time telling them everything? What if the person said, all right, I will do something. I'll stick an ad in the paper. I'll go on late night TV. I'll do something saying information that you probably want to hear. Of course, the person could have started off in a real fog and said, everything that you always wanted to know, 
consider that a little humor. But let us say that the person started off in a more reasonable way and simply put out ads that said, information in which you might be interested if you are reasonable, right thinking, humane, sophisticated, intellectual men and women. And what if the person tried to take what the gods had said and specifically told somebody, assuming, still in my fiction, because you can do this in fiction, assuming in some way the god or gods said things that verbally, in the English language, since that's what we're speaking, was the medium between the gods and this person. And so the person turned around, perhaps paraphrased, perhaps literally tried to say what the God said to him. That made every sense in the world and answered everything to this person, and they turned around and said it. Then what would you expect? See, the only information that you've got came through your senses of everything that you have read about and heard about, and now you think that you can imagine it, or you think in some way that the mind is freed from those kind of constraints and that you have imagined all sorts of transcendental, metaphysical, in the true sense, the non-spiritual sense, of beyond the confines of the senses that you think that you can imagine things beyond that, and you can't. And so you would imagine, at line level consciousness, you would imagine that the story that Moses brought back from a god, the story that Buddha said he got when he was blown away and became one with the universe, and suddenly, over a period of hours and days, that that for which he had sought for years and years and years was just as clear as fingernail polish. So you may have taken some of this in the past as being very important. Or you might have read some of the so-called Sufi writers coming out of the Islam milieu. And you may have thought that some of this, these poetic musings, some of these obviously allegorical stories, reveal something beyond the senses, and that this was truly inspired work that you had read, that you had heard read, but most of you, you read it. And without any analyzation, and without you being aware of it, that became the benchmark. That became the template that you thought, if I ever find somebody who truly knows any secret knowledge, it will fit somewhere in this cat category or categories. It will be close to this, because I feel myself very close to the truth the great truth, that is, with a capital G and a T, already. All I need is just a little teeny bit, because if me, if poor old humble me, is this close to the great truth, then surely the guide somewhere, there's got to be somebody better than me. Of course, most people, you'll figure there's a lot of people better than you. But there's got to be somebody really, really better than me that the gods has told everything to. Because as much as I know, I get it all but about this much. So there's surely some son of a bitch somewhere that knows it all. There's got to be. It only makes sense, do it not? Yes, it do. If I know this much, there's somebody that knows it all. So I've already got, what, 75, 80, 85 percent of it. All I need is sort of a validation of what I know, plus these one or two little minor details. Of course, those one or two little minor details you may notice is that which strangles everybody. Little minor details, you start off thinking, I know it all, and if I'm already, you almost know it all, I'm pointing out to you what you know is simply that which you've taken in through the senses, and now you're waiting for some kind of clarification of, of that, with just a little smidgen of a little more. But this little smidgen is everything, at any rate. At any rate. Then, if my fictional person to whom the gods had talked put out the word and he said, I'm going to tell you everything that you want to know that's worthwhile. I'm not going to tell you necessarily what size the Corvette engine is going to be in 90, 1992, but the kinds of things that you, serious, right-thinking, decent, humane, 
enlightened, sophisticated, spiritually hungry people consider to be the burning questions, I'm going to tell you because I know. And I know, not from reading, I know because the big guy told me, me, not in a group. I didn't learn it in some cave. Whatever reason, he set me down. He said, look, here it is, and so I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you just why he told me. And I know it's true. So then you're prepared, let us say. You say, okay, I'm ready to go. I brought along you know, one index card because since I know about 85%, all I need is tell me that little bit. Go ahead and do your regular speech, and I'll listen. And all that's going to take is you'll assume that the first part's going to simply be a validation of everything that you think you already got down. And so if you'll be able to just sit there and go, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and just hold a little index card, and you're just waiting for that little modicum of uncertainty. Ha ha. That all right, he'll finally get to that. And he's going to say, all right, and here is the kicker. And then you'll, you'll get that down, and it'll all be just, all be very clear then. If my little story did take place in as direct and pristine a fashion as I have described it, then I must, surprise again, suggest to you two possibilities. One is that you would sit there prepared, and this person to whom the gods had talked in this day and time and told the person everything that you wanted to know. And the person said, I'm going to tell you in just the way that the big guy told me, and they told you, you would be back to, those of you who recall, God comes to Cleveland scenario, that you would listen, and you'd go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then the guy said, and that's it. And he'd leave. And the only thing he had told you was everything that you, quote, already knew. <laughs> Second possibility is this. It would freak you out. And I know that term arose <laughs> a couple of decades ago from a so-called drug culture, but I can't really improve upon it, and I've always liked it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's been used in connection with me and this just in the last 96 hours. It would freak you out. But, but, as many of you suspect, not on the basis that the person would say something that was slimy, frightening, it would not like be like some sort of four-dimensional reliving, a representation of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre meets Jesus or something. <laughs> it's not that. And it's not there would be some sort of message of foreboding such as, all right, most of what you, I'm just making this up, of course, remember this is all fiction, that the person said, right, that God's told me such and such is true, that God is love, and you should help each other and all this. And by the way, next Tuesday, God's going to blow everything up, except it's going to take about 10,000 years, and you're going to hurt and ache for 10,000 years watching yourself come apart. That's all. I don't mean that. Most of you, I guess, that'd freak you out. It's not that. Because life... Now let's jump from God's for a second, since that is a very poor description. And God only knows how long life is going to continue to use that. <laughs> I could say, thank God, I don't have you know, that much longer to live, and I don't have to contend with it, but it looks like it's going to go on and on and on and on. But. Look at it now as life, the description I have given you. Perhaps before all this is over, I don't mean tonight, but perhaps I will give one final description that will push some of you over the edge, but you should have been able by now to do something specifically on your own with me talking about the life of life, that it is an apparently closed system as far as consciousness at its 
best, at its ordinary best, can perceive it as a closed system. That we're not dealing with forces. Read gods outside the system, such as Michelangelo's great <laughs> of a big old god going wham and off the tip of his finger comes all of this. You cannot use that anymore, not a few people. That is not what the gods are talking about. If this was religion, I would tell you, as I start out my piece of fiction, that the god. Now remember, I'm making this up. I'm saying if it was that way, then I'd tell you that long before I met you, the god, he didn't fool around with a burning bush and he didn't give me stone tablets because I got a weak back anyway. <laughs> that he told me that, hey, I'm a new god. No, I'm a god for the times. I'm a, I'm a god who keeps up. I trim down the lapels. No more bell bottoms. I'm up to date. The gods everybody's talking about, forget it. I'm not interested right now in stopping and really going into this, but I'd point out to you that the old things, Moses, in certain respect, Jesus, Muhammad, just the beginning of all their message is, hey, here we are worshiping this god or these gods, but look, all we're doing is we're fooling around with non-gods, bad gods, weak gods. The God talked to me, and he said, do away with this. Now, you can see it. It's not really a right angle turn, but you can see the beginnings of all religion. You can see it with Buddha, insofar as what Hinduism seemed to be at the time, that it went from, here's what everybody is doing in this group that I'm talking to. And it's wrong. We're worshiping, you people are worshiping, studying, listening to the wrong gods, or gods that are outdated. And so it was a slight turn. And if this was religious times, I would tell you that everything that I've told you up until now, everything that I know, everything that I can see, everything, is on the basis, not in some way to give some new description to Christianity, to Judaism, Islam, etc., to any Sufi stories, to any Gurdjieff stories, to any type, sort, stripe of any so-called esoteric, exotic, metaphysical, spiritual, religious teaching that anybody's ever heard of, ever. If we were under those conditions, I would have to tell you that this is what happened. Remember, this didn't. But if we were under those conditions, I would tell you that God came and told me, look, and that he and I sit down, <laughs> had some coffee and we talked and you know, he acknowledged the fact that I knew enough about all the major religions to get by and I could fake it and that I understood other things that I didn't get out of books and that, you know, you've come a long way, baby, and you've done all right. But let me tell you, all that I'm going to give you the answers to, but it's got nothing to do with that. All that's gone. That's outdated. And it's in a completely other direction. Now, that's not true. It's a right-hand direction. It's the best description I can give you. And, three-dimensional world that goes off at a right angle and then it disappears. That would be a religious revelation, if that's what this was about. If that could be described, I assure you that it would freak you out. That's, remember, that's the second possibility. The first one is, hey, what else is new? It's just somebody else saying, hey, uh, religion's no good. Or this religion's no good. Everybody's heard that. As soon as the first guy stood up and said, hey, I just invented something new. I invented religion. Before the hour was out and he told somebody, somebody that he just told it to went, well, wait a minute. If some of you people here in the crowd think like I do, this man has just invented or discovered something that's, I think, potentially dangerous. And so I'm in favor of non-religion. Would everybody who agrees join me? And so his original crowd, or whatever X was, a good portion of them ran over within the hour and joined up with non-religion, anti-religion. But since this is not religion, and we're back to my description I'm reminding you of, of the life of life, the body of life, which is splendid. I never have gotten down and drawn it out diagrammed it, and I never have gone into great philosophical descriptions. But it is apparently what you need to see 
apparently compared to what has been the gods before, the forces before being outside the system, there is no out there. There is no out there between you and life in the equation of I plus not I. There is no way to separate yourself from that. If you don't have some continuing hot flash of that, it's a real shame that you are a fish indivisible from water. That all notions of emotion, invisible energies, even the use of the intellect, the conveyance of information, of feeling, you are in a primordial soup. There is no out there away from you. If there was, you would be dead. If there was, you would not be conscious. There simply is not. There is no force or forces that have any profitable validity that would exist out there. To the body of life, there is no out there. Now, I'll grant you this, I have never gone into, nor am I about to, what life may do for recreation. That if life is playing softball somewhere, then compared to us, of course, the softball is out there. But you don't know anything about that. As far as the body of life is concerned, there is no out there to it either. There are no places to look for forces, much less guides. Out there, this is not poetic, this is not allegorical. As far as consciousness can see now, there is no out there. None, not just here, but there is no out there for life, apparently. So this secret information, why would it not have a direct effect on you or even large numbers of people? Why would it fall into the two possibilities I mentioned to you, of it being old hat and yesterday's news, or it would freak you out? Yesterday's news is always accepted. Thus is life predictable. Thus can you go rent a boat down in the islands and after hungering for some news when you thought you wanted to be a semi-hermitized recluse and you dig down in the build somewhere after a week and you find a paper and it seems all right until you realize after reading it and rereading it several days and keeping up that instead of it being two weeks old, you find out it's five years old. Nobody ever took me up on it. I gave to some of you a new business idea. You know how hard it is nowadays to get good reception on radio and you're traveling in different cities, those of you who are news hounds. Is it somebody? You're going to make cassettes of an all news station right here in your city and then sell it to people so when they're out in the boonies between metropolitan areas and they hunger for the news, they can whip it out and stick it in and hear the news. Instead of God's, the life of life, which has a parallel to the life of an individual, if you know how to interpret it, which I constantly do 90, 95% for you, it's what I call sketching and asking you rhetorical questions and giving you suggestions. In the same way that you have apparently conflicting information, that you take in apparently conflicting data, that you apparently try and pass on conflicting data. And when it is not conflicting, all you've got to do is observe it in this peculiar way, and you see that even when it's not conflicting, the potential for a conflict is there in that all you seem to take in and all that you seem to know is based on a binary system. On that basis, 
what people cannot realize is that in the entire body of life there is a continuing string apparently of conflicting information it is attributed of course to man and those who are still religious would say there are religious truths that we should be living by they are absolute unchangeable what has fucked it up is man trying to set up denominations varying religions man trying to interpret the holy word whatever the holy word is that the person is referring to am I in this case that it is man who has turned it into a tower of Babel and it is not there appears to be conflicting information because you only have two ears to listen with there appears to be conflicting information there appears to be everything limited to a binary solution because you only have two eyes to read with no one who is still wired up produced by life to operate in the religious field no one can in any manner codify all the information they cannot as they would be want to say they cannot hear the voice of God all they hear is the confusion of man or they might say what we hear is the confusion of the anti-gods the Lucifers and the Satans and the devils and the demons we're hearing babble we're hearing balderdash and it's drowning out the beautiful voice of the God and it's not this activity is extreme even to life I'm going to use simple terminology again when life thinks about such as this and it thinks about such as this right now <laughs> it's doing it right now and I don't mean just because of me and us but we right now are a part of it life is thinking about this crap right now but to life over a larger span even to life this is freaky that does not sound very philosophical or religious I'm aware but trust me <laughs> this almost freaks life out and the proof is all around you many of you are now so far gone in this that tonight anytime we meet anytime I talk it's not freaky many of you are so far gone that you do not understand that if we took just an average night of us getting together and me staying up here and pacing around and talking we do a nice little logo put a name on it put it on television many many of you are so far gone now that you don't understand that that hit the screen better exposure than just opposite dirty George on underground cable somewhere that if it had a real exposure and people suddenly turned it on and kept it on like here's a 30 minute show of whatever we called it some of you are so far gone many of you are that you don't understand that many people would look at that and get freaked out no turban I'm not preaching an overthrow of anything I don't make anti jokes against any religion or group of people all the various things that would seem to be part of some sort of basically good decent if not even self-named religious or spiritual activity we seem to fit in or I seem to fit in generally what I'm saying with the basic requirements <laughs> but you don't understand that this would freak out many people many many people all right so then your ordinary intelligence could say assuming I'm telling you the truth 
Of course, many people would fall into possibility one. They just wouldn't hear anything. That's why I've heard all that crap before. But many people would be freaked out. Then your ordinary consciousness could say, well, why? This thing is almost too extreme for life when it thinks about it. And anytime you get out of the ghettos of life, anytime you get out of the areas of life's body that are still being driven primarily by the lower circuitries, and again, I point out that this part of the planet, this part of life's body, and so far as this part, that this planet is part of life's body, we are right where life is most conscious, right where life thinks of the strangest things where life is most sophisticated, most educated. But this is almost too freaky for life. It is never a widespread religion. It is never commonly popular in some way. When I say that life is becoming fairly middle class here, or that we are not only just by accident living at the cutting edge of life's consciousness, it is, of course, what I was saying, the cutting edge of where life is the most bourgeois. Life simultaneously, if you knew what that meant, but just in the sequential string of conscious events, just simultaneously, life thinks about this and at the same time goes, and goes freaky. <laughs> and the part of life's body always that goes freaky is much, much stronger than the places and the times that it thinks about this kind of stuff. Much more. You will always, in my piece of fiction, and perhaps otherwise, I suggest, if in some way my fictional person to whom the gods or God had talked, attempted to present in a straightforward manner and got a big hearing. The majority, as I said, some just wouldn't hear anything or they'd say, oh, I know all that and they'd leave. But a larger portion would be freaked out. And that is simply a representation of what I'm telling you that even though life thinks of this, I didn't make it up. You know, it's only religious people that believe that sort of crap. Then I got out of a book or somebody told me, or worse yet, of course, that's when you're a fake spiritual leader, is what if that son of a bitch has made this up? <laughs> Heavens. If you'll pardon my lapse into religious terminology, I say, Heavens, that is shocking. That somebody just, just made it up? Oh, give me a break. But the larger part of this accidentally fictional audience I'm seeing that gave this message a big hearing, the stronger portion of them, whether we be speaking in numbers or otherwise, the stronger portion of them would be freaked out. They would move against it. They would turn a deaf ear, but it would not simply be passive. They would denounce it. They would say, freaky. But we're talking now about the larger part of life's body when it thinks about it. When it ponders such matters as this, the larger part of it goes, no, no. Not when I've just moved into a good neighborhood, got a good house now, the jobs, I'm, I can quit working two jobs, the kids are back grown, got a little money saved, might buy a boat. No. Besides what I already point out outright, I will suggest to you that even though this is all fiction, not all of it's fiction. There is an absolute schedule at work under which everyone must operate. The ordinary level 
the operations take place in very well-known, observable manners that reflect something that people do not ordinarily consider. I mentioned various examples throughout the last months and years, but it is a kind of winding down, it is a kind of increasing bourgeois attitude in the individual. One fairly recent example, if you recall, I plucked out of contemporary news of an old man denouncing sex shops in his neighborhood. The man was literate, had a fair presentation, point out where he lived here, and now these sex shops have moved just within a block. I can see them from my home. And he was very concerned, upset, and he said a few intelligent sentences about you know why this is not good for the community, the moral fiber of our country. And I also point out to you, you should be able to feel this. You people don't have to be 65. You're already 65. You don't have to be 65 in dog years, our years. <laughs> that this reality is in you and you should be able to hear it. That man moved back 45 years ago when he was 14 or 15, if somebody told him that there was a little dirty book the kind men like, little French postcards, and they were up on the top of a tree, and there were spikes driven throughout the tree, <laughs> and up there were copperheads and pythons and snakes waiting up there, the man would have crawled up. He would have given away one arm. He'd have got on his hands and knees on broken glass to get one of those. There is the same reflection in life, but you've got to watch it to where life does not operate in the same way that people do not operate. Most of you are now just still having to take my word for it over a wide period of time. None of this operates in a sequential manner as it appears to. And so I was about to say that life goes through the same kind of process, but it is not sequential and there are parts of life's body right now that is, there are people on this planet that would crawl through quicksand, broken glass, to find the little dirty books the kind men like. But there are other parts of the world, the wit right here, that most people nowadays, instead of being 65 and worried about it down the street or across the street from you, most people nowadays would not walk across the street to pick up one if you saw it in the gutter. Most people have seen it so much now, it is so common that even at an early age, you don't have to be 65, but very few people now would exert any great effort to pursue such as that. But all this goes on simultaneously when I say that life in our part of its body, in our time zone, if you can still take that picturization, that there are time zones on this planet which is simply a part of life's body operating simultaneously, wherein it may appear to be 10 o'clock here, and just as valid, it is 9 o'clock right to our west. In that same way, when I say that life is getting to be pretty middle class right here, it is simultaneously otherwise in other parts of its body other parts of this planet. But wherever this is going on, wherever life is having thoughts about this thing, its strongest reaction is that it's freaky, that it is too extreme, and it's correct based upon everything life's done. If life wants to change its mind, then I'm wrong. And that's not possible because if it changes its mind, I'll tell you, if it gives me a chance, of course if it makes me privy beforehand or simultaneously. But based upon everything, if you could see so-called history as being non-sequential, if you could see how it is all going at right angles to what has been observed, then I point out, I would point out to you, or at least suggest to you most strongly, that wherever this has popped up, wherever you imagine it has popped up in your knowledge of history, which I 
again, must tell you were the low levels. So imagine the other levels that you've never heard of. Wherever it has popped up, whenever it was, if it was 2000 BC, 2000 AD, somewhere in the middle, will it be here, the Middle East, the Far East, wherever it was, and in whatever tone, whatever tongue, whatever tenor, whatever timber, primarily through whatever circuit, be it the reds, yellows, or blues, that life thought this. At that time and place, the majority of itself, the stronger reaction to it was too extreme. This is too extreme. And what I'm telling you is that was a fact based upon what has happened. It cannot be heard directly. It cannot be heard among large numbers of people, life will not think about it in the same way for a long period of time. Life will not operate on it. Life will not move on it. And I'll tell you what's new about you. The continuing cry of people that begin to see and to hear something is, how can I increase this? And I try and give hints and encouragement. Life doesn't operate on it in the way in which you imagine that you would operate on it that if there was a real secret, if there was a little pill to take, if you'd give it to me, by God, I'd take it. I don't care what warnings you gave with it. If you told me that that one pill that you've got has every possibility, just almost total assurance that I'll know everything I want to know, I'll take it, I'll take it. There's no such pill. If there was, you couldn't take it. If there was, you'd freak out. Life does not produce such pills. Life does not take those pills itself. When life thinks about this, it's for short periods of time. And then it goes long periods of time and it doesn't think about it. And then when it does think about it, it thinks about it somewhere else in this body. And it changes the terminology. Tell me what's new about you. This doesn't sound familiar? Yeah, but the gods have got to do better than me. How about this? Instead of people worrying about gods outside the system and that gods would do better than me, would you accept this? That they could do worse than you, but it'd be on a much bigger scale. The music would be better. The backgrounds would be better. The whole production would make you look like an elementary school play. Now, those of you who are sharp enough for the good old line level yellow circuit, you must see that that's the same thing as doing better. All you got to do is be able to do worse in a magnificent fashion. <laughs> Let me take a few more swipes at my fictional story. What if this person had been given this direct information in our day and time? did decide that I should do something with this. Imagine any reason you want to, but I'm still saying, other than your old ideas, that the guide said, look, I'm telling you this, but you've got to go out and spread it. And I'm telling you this because I need it to be told, or whatever the story is. What if the guy just told the guy this, the person this? Then you can imagine whatever reasons you want to, if you believe in individual motivation, of why the person did it. But let's say that they do try to do something about it, or putting out signs advertising a lecture of some kind. Let me make up the story further. The person tries to tell some of it to people. In my story, <laughs> In my story, it would not take long for this person. Now, this is just one scenario. It's fiction. Remember, I can make up anything I want to. I can make the story go any way I want to. But this possibility comes to mind, that the person tries talking about it. And in my story, very shortly, he gets real. I keep saying he, but remember, nowadays, it could be almost anybody. <laughs> Except perhaps Billy Graham and Alexander Haig and, well, never mind. <laughs> In my story, 
after a reasonable length of time and after some reasonable attempts to pass along the information, and also let me point out that the person in my story doesn't do anything extremely weird superficially. No turbans, no robes, no exotic appearing rituals, which some of you I think is already suspected somewhere along the line sequentially. But in a world of fiction, I'd tell you this. When the so-called truth of some kind, revelations of some kind, are tied directly, inseparably, to theater, you would not find my fictitious person there. You got low-level activity. The more low-level it is, the more theater you have. So my person in my little story, no theater, just attempts to tell some people. And then in my story, after a reasonable time, after a reasonable efforts, this person becomes, how shall I put it? I'm still trying to stick, so I'm back to my religious, pseudo-religious based story. The person becomes, oh, what should we say? How about pissed? <laughs> that doesn't quite hit it, but how about pissed? Maybe tired. Not depressed, none of that ordinary stuff, but kind of in a real futuristic, militaristic, stand-up kind of guy, just kind of pissed and tired. But you'd have to understand, even in my piece of fiction, that this would be a different kind. Ordinary people simply suffer. As always, at extremes, they either suffer with stuff that's too large or too small, or they're pissed about things that are either too large Not depressed, none of that ordinary stuff, but kind of in a real futuristic, militaristic, stand-up kind of guy, just kind of pissed and tired. But you'd have to understand, even in my piece of fiction, that this would be a different kind. Ordinary people simply suffer. As always, at extremes, they either suffer with stuff that's too large or too small, or they're pissed about things that are either too large or too small, at least in my piece of fiction here. That is worrying, suffering for years and years over the size of one's nose. <laughs> that if I had ever had a nose job back when I, if I'd had it, if I could afford to have it back when it really mattered, how much different my life would be. No worrying about what people say, says about the person. Take that as being one extreme, either too large or too small. And then the other extreme being such things as the impending danger of nuclear holocaust, or I guess the ultimate one for ordinary people is, am I really going to die? <laughs> so you've got extremes from too large, in my piece of fiction, to too small. That my nose is too big, and what's going to happen to me when I die? But in my piece of fiction, this unusual person to whom the gods had talked, his being pissed would be a different type. It would not be either too large or too small. Then if he could find the gods in my piece of fiction, I suggest he'd be well within his rights <laughs> to say, why did you tell me this? <laughs> Oh, now I grant you this, there were times past 
that I resemble some of the people who show up when I try to talk, says my fictional man. Now, I recall I did go through a period like, seemed like everybody else did, similar to it, of wandering around here and there and reading this and that. And then you just told me, but what I want to know now is why. Now, I'm pleased. All right, maybe he'd say this. He gets the guys back and they sit down and have one other cup of coffee. And he says, all right, I was pleased. At that time, if you had asked me for something, I'd have given it to you. I'd have given you anything. So I admit I was pleased that you gave me just what I wanted. But now I want to know, why in the hell did you do it? What's the point? What is the purpose? Life can periodically think about this, but its strongest reaction to it thinking about it is that it is too extreme, and it almost freaks life out. It would appear if you looked at history as being a valid reflection, not only of what happened behaviorally, what happened materially, but the attempts for people to stick in their so-called psychological explanations, especially in these so-called realms of religion and spiritual efforts, etc., apparently the gods would send forth what would amount to straight line prophets. That is, that these other people that the gods seem to talk to, that not only do they tell them some secret, as your religious stories would have it, tell them these secrets, the truths, but then it also says, all right, now go do so and so. And it's a very straight line, it's very straightforward. All right, now do this and go out and tell everybody, or tell everybody within your voting district, tell everybody in the fourth ward, tell everybody between here and Santa Monica. It would apparently be a real example of straight line phenomenon that the gods or a god said, all right, here is the information that you and a large number of people want to know. Here it is. Now go do so-and-so. And do so-and-so at the very least would be go tell everybody because they've been waiting to hear it. And it will have such and such effect. Or if the gods didn't go that far, the person would go do it, and he'd immediately see the effect because everybody would say, verily, verily. Hip, hip, hooray, for he's a jolly good prophet. <laughs> but that's not what happens. Now, it apparently happens, if you're only looking with binary eyesight, it apparently happens. But you've always got to find the area of theater. You've got to find, and if it's popular, you've got theater going on. It is low-level God activity. <laughs> back, back to my piece of fiction. But what appears to be straight-line prophets, straight-line metaphysical phenomenon, is very low-level. It was not satisfying to any of you people. It is information that is fairly available to large numbers of people. It requires no individual effort. It does not alleviate, fill in any word you want to, suffering, doubt, ignorance, prejudice, hatred. It does not relieve it. It appears to be a prescription for it, but the cure is never forthcoming. But those apparently involved with it, those that say, and large numbers of people react to it in a positive way, those who say the gods have talked to me, and here's the presentation of it. There is also another aspect of it. It's at the end of the theater, at the end of the drama, in that particular case, life always crushes everybody. And I don't mean just by killing you. When you're dealing with what appears to be straight line prophets, it always crushes them. That is, on their deathbed, they always revert back to their religion. 
And of course, by prophets, I'm, if you don't follow the terminology I was using right then in my prayer description, <laughs> is somebody who has apparently taken a turn from their religion. They're now apparently a new religious prophet. They're now a swami, a guru, but on their deathbed, unless they're struck down real quick by an oncoming freight train. But if they linger long, around long enough to be on a deathbed, they all go back to being Baptist and Catholics. They all become Orthodox again. They all become bourgeois. They all become middle class. This, all of you know, you new people, I remind you, this is not an attack on humanity. It is not a shortcoming of people. This is not me playing some new age Erasmus to a whole new generation of fools, but it is something that is not normally seen in this way. No matter how great the theater was, no matter the following, when there was an apparent straight line, prophet of some kind, religious person, revealer of some great truth, give him enough time to get on his deathbed, at least a couple of hours, if you're going, don't cut corners on me verbally, 30 minutes in, long enough that he goes, oh, I don't feel good, and the doctor gets there and looks at him and says, I'll say, you'll be dead in an hour, and he lays down, which most people want to lay down when they find they're going to be dead in an hour. No matter how, no matter how exotic this so-called guru, minister, rabbi, new age, flim flam, no matter how exotic from the ordinary level, he, she, the teaching, the activity, the rituals would seem to have been. Give them long enough to get on a deathbed and lay down and they'll go back to being Baptist. It's a fact. They will suddenly, for some reason, apparently see the light that I misled everybody. And of course, mainly me. I'm the one about to buy the farm. And they'll quick. Send me a priest, send me a rabbi, find me a Baptist minister. Call up Jimmy Swaggart and tell him I'm leaving him everything I got. <laughs> I finally see the light, and I thank the Lord. I thank the gods for giving me this last, this extra 30 minutes to come to my senses. Whew, what a close call. That is not an attack on some individual somewhere. That is the nature of life, finding things to be too extreme. That is the nature of middle age. That is the nature of, I'm pretty well settled down and I can't do anything that extreme. I guess it would give Karl Marx, if he understood it, it would just give him the warm, the glowing warmies <laughs> that everybody finally becomes part of that same middle class. <laughs> that everyone finally becomes on their deathbed, including life in its middle age, prim, proper, would not go into a peep show, would not have anything other than, well, perhaps a small glass of wine with dinner. Dope? No, no thank you, none for me. Adultery? I seem to have finally gained some stability, some semblance of sanity, now that I've gotten into my 40s. I do not care to be freaked out. But we are not talking about individuals, we are talking about the stronger areas of life's body and its reactions to such matters as this when life thinks about it. Besides my made-up stories, there is some practical significance to this. If it was still religion time, if we were in a different time zone, let me point out to you, remind you one more time, there are different time zones and some of this is still contemporaneously valid in life's body in the same way that you 
still have so-called daydreams, you still relive your past, so-called psychological traumas, the recollection of childhood, past hurts, past insults, past shortcomings. Tell me what else is new. If you can do it, I assure you life is doing it, which is a cheap way of putting it. But there are areas of life's body contemporaneous with us sitting here now that are still operating in the religious zone, which is somewhere between Rocky Mountain and Rocky Mountain Revisited time, I guess. But wherever it is taking place, and it can be happening right here, contemporaneous with even in our time zone, there are parts of its body still doing that. But where it is religious, there's another phenomenon that I'll mention before I stop this. Is that anybody, which is everybody, can only and must worship only one of three gods. That's all you got. The names change, as tongues change, as times change, as a movement from one tribe to another changes, but there are only three gods out in the ordinary world that have ever been available. Whether it seems to be a major religion, a minor religion, a schism, a reform movement, a return to orthodoxy, No matter what it is called, there are only three gods available ordinarily. If through some curious quirk, the kind of information that life thinks about in regards to this sort of thing, if it did get out into life, if it did get a big hearing, if it accidentally got picked up what was going on and got picked up some way accidentally, electronically, on an uplink and it sent it up to a satellite and suddenly Miami Vice <laughs> went off the air on some Friday night on ABC network and instead was me or some form of this. I say the major action would be freak out time. But what I was going to leave you with is not just freak out time in just the ways I described, but vis-a-vis -vis me pointing out to you there are only three gods to worship available, is it's freaky that everyone would take this as being religious, even though I could be hollering fuck, doing what little theater I do that apparently I'm not a Baptist preacher. They would still take this as being religion. I don't know whether all of you know this or not. If I said, the opening, before the credits roll, before the name, I said, listen, this is not religion. <laughs> we had somebody better than me. We could dig up Frank Gallup with a good voice. Somebody say, this is not religion. As soon as I started, everybody would accept this as religion, because it is, as far as they can tell. But they would freak out on the basis as they can't tell, they cannot identify, they cannot even feel it in their own genes, which of the three gods is he working for? <laughs> from which of the three gods does this come from? And it does not come from any of the three available gods. Thus, verily, verily, I say unto you, it is supremely freaky to ordinary people. What it amounts to is a god that is all-encompassing, if we were talking about gods. It's all-encompassing, indefinable, and unstable. All the very things that the other three gods are not at any given time and place. It's only been three gods. That's all it's ever been. No matter if some apparent prophet in some tribe somewhere came and said, all right, we've been worshiping God X. God Y has talked to me. Take everything I to do with God X and throw it out. But right, you might think, all right, that took care of two of the gods. But then according to history, 500 years later, 50 years later, this group of you-know-whos from up north on horseback, they came down and they took God Y and all the good work that they'd done then and just trampled it. Broke up all the statues, burned down all the places of worship, tore up all the books, and made people begin to worship the head horseman, the head of the gang. You could keep that up and apparently run out of gods, and you're wrong. They rename but there are only three. 
and wherever they are, if they are in very crude areas of life's body, wherein they are apparently worshiping some physical being, a man there, will it be that, or it apparently is in some so-called metaphysical line of teaching back to some other man long gone, or whether apparently is the ordinary religions of worshiping a God, a force outside the system, all the descriptions are almost totally interchangeable that the gods are the god men, the prophets, but ultimately the gods are always what? They're unchanging, the truth is unchanging, the right gods are the same today as they were yesterday and throughout eternity. The truth, the truth of our God, our religion, is unchanging. That's why we worship this book, or that's why we hold these teachings holy. They were true X thousands of numbers of years ago, or last year, and they're true now. That, those descriptions are all true about any of the three available gods but they would correctly react to this by being freaked out in that this obviously, they can't analyze it, they can't discuss it, they wouldn't even want to discuss it. That this is not coming from one of the three established gods. It's coming from somewhere that is simply freaky. I know I said I'd quit, but I got to give you one other piece since I'm talking about religion tonight. In my religious fiction, if there was a kind of religion, let me tell you about one other aspect. But now we'd be in a religion that would truly be freaky. If there was a fourth religion, a fourth God, in this religion, if my fictitious man, a person, finally got tired of being tired and pissed and got pissed of being pissed and tired. His religion would have all sorts of things I could make up, but one of them I just made up, which is going to be my PS to this. There would be an aspect of his religion that would be the tough shit aspect. be all-encompassing, indefinable, and above all, unstable. There must be a theological term for aspect. It doesn't come to me. Tough shit dynamic, tough shit ritual, tough shit canon of the religion. <laughs> tough shit practice of this fourth religion. Even in the fourth religion, I'll leave it down to a binary process right quick. You'd have your choice that you wouldn't have the other three gods, the other three religions. You could either whine, fidget, and twist over apparently what life is dished out to you, or else you would holler, tough shit, and press on. But you would really have to have a four-dimensional understanding of tough shit, because it is not resignation, it is not whining. You would have to shout, it would have to be a rallying cry. It would have to be the ultimate to you word of encouragement. The kind of things that would make the buffaloes go finally, after all these years. It would go at a right angle to my first description of the binary possibilities. It would go at right angles to whining, because whatever life seems to have dished out, everybody stands there with their tray, <laughs> and maybe you look down, and maybe one or two items, mashed potatoes, you know, I sort of like, but I can look already. I don't have to sit down and look and see they're lumpy. I can see that they're prefab. I don't like the gravy. The beans, well, they don't look bad, and I like beans, but there are not enough of them. But then a whole bunch of other stuff. 
But there we all stand. Everybody got a tray, and it laughed, dished it out, and you can't seem to go back. You can't get your money back. And you finally see, even though people can't admit it, you finally see that you can't go back up there and then change what's on your plate. So you can whine about it. You can sit there and fidget. You can play with your food. You can refuse to eat. You can try and stick it in your ears. You can try and hide it. And you suffer over it. But now all of that is at least at right angles removed from what I'd say would be the tough shit canon. As their life has dished it out. You've been served it. And of course, anybody got this far, they've got a full understanding, not simply a three-dimensional, not simply a binarily describable, not simply a verbally describable understanding that, all right, this is what I've been served. Everybody got a tray, and everybody got more or less the same things on them. You got different combinations and different portions, and everybody's hands apparently are welded to the damn tray. <laughs> And you got it, and you're going to have to hold on to it for 60 years. And everybody else is whining, complaining, theorizing about what if we could take it back? What if there is somebody back in the back room? What if there is a matron somewhere that if I could just find him or her, would go, oh, there, there, certainly you can have a new plate. <laughs> and you'd sit there at the table for 60 years, and you and other people talk about it, even though the pamphlets are passed around. And you look down, and it says that somebody has got their plate turned in before. They don't know exactly who it was, and they can't find them. Or whoever it was is now dead, and they're not sure of the process. You can go through all that. Or the other possibility of why I'm saying you would be the religion of a fourth kind. Of course, I guess I'd do some of this for a little bit of not crude shock value, but just to stay outside the ordinary realm of descriptions of me calling it a tough shit canon. Is you start off like everybody else. You've been dished out something. It's not that much different from anybody else. And I don't care who you are. You could be my fictitious man that the gods talk to. I assure you that my fictitious man, when the gods talked to him, he was sitting at the damn table. And there it was, the same stuff that he was originally served was still in front of him. When in my made-up story, when the gods came down and talked to him. But I assure you that if you could see that, rather than whining, fidgeting, playing with your food, suffering over it, theorizing about what if, what if, is to be able to shout out, to cry out, tough shit, not to a priest, not to a rabbi, no questioning to it, no whine to it, and believe it or not, no real aggression in it. Just tough shit. <laughs> and press on. But no one else can press on. Everyone believes in some way they're pressing on. Or should I say, most people believe that they are being pressed on. <laughs> believe it or not, all of this has very practical significance. And believe it or not, all this has something to do well, what is taking place inside this activity and to many of you personally. And yet there must be, would you not agree, the possibility of a true straight line phenomenon somewhere so that someone as deserving as you, someone who can, for long periods of time, apparently, you know, up to moments, seconds, minutes, apparently not fidget, whine, feel fearful, feel put upon personally, can actually feel the reality of you seeing, hearing, thinking, smelling, existing, not at eye level, but right up in here and that you can get above that. And it makes you want to find, I guess, Leonard and Lowe and say, on a clear day, <laughs> not only can I see forever, I can see everybody's tray. I can see the whole lunch room. I can see where the food came from. I know where the bathrooms are. I know where all the food's going. 
and then cry out with a great deal of, if such was possible, religious fervor and joy of tough shit. <laughs> You must admit, those of you who have been here a few months, those of you who have been around me now for a few years, you got to admit it's been a freaky, if not weird, few months and few years. And I was pointing out recently that everyone should be engaged, if you knew how, in a kind of daily, even continual, kind of real prayer to life, a thanks to life, that I am here and what little I can see, what little I can hear, that it happens. But that's why I hate to get sort of Mr. Nice Guy and use things about kinds of prayer and all that, because likewise, some of you should begin to place that you can almost feel a certain kind of, dare I say it, sympathy for my fictional person of feeling somewhat pissed and tired. Be either pissed and tired at me because I'm not telling you enough fast enough, if you're the crude sort, if you're the kind still sitting there in the cafeteria.